Good morning, everyone, and welcome to No-Till Tuesdays. This is the first webinar of our No-Till webinar series that will um, happen each Tuesday for the next four weeks. And we're, we're really excited to offer this webinar series this, um, this spring to teach everyone a bit more about no-till agriculture and no-till crop production. Our webinar series today um, is brought to you through a grant sponsored by the Northeast Extension Risk Management Education Center through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, I'm Heather Darby, and I'm on the line today to welcome you all to um, our first webinar. And I wanted to start our welcome by talking about our no-till top 10, top 10 factors that will lead to successful no-till. And the goal of this very short presentation before we turn uh, the webinar over to Dr. Doug Beagle um, is to just get us geared up for the next four weeks and items that you'll be learning about. Um, and things to be thinking about before you head to the field to begin no-till. So again, 10 factors that we hope will help you um, successfully implement no-till on your farm. So let's start with some management considerations. So number one is education. And if you're sitting on this webinar today, you're doing exactly what you should be doing, trying to learn more about all the strategies and tools that you'll need to make no-till successful on your farm. You have to have a desire to make it work and understand the differences between no-till and conventional cropping system. Number two, it's also really important for you to understand the potential risks um, that you might encounter and then also the rewards um, to make the right decisions for your farm when you're dealing with no-till. Probably most importantly is learning about all the details. There's lots of details that you need to pay attention to, um, not just with growing the crop, but the equipment that you'll be using to be successful in no-till. And then number four, patience. I think we all um, sometimes have trouble being patient. We want everything to succeed. We want everything to be perfect. There's a lot riding on it. But with no-till, sometimes you just need to be patient. You need to wait for the soil conditions um, and weather conditions to be conducive so that your no-till crop can be successful. There's also a lot of agronomic considerations um, that are involved with no-till planting. So number five is really considering the field conditions way before you start planting. You want fields that are properly drained. You want fields at the adequate soil temperature before you go out there and start um, no-till planting. We really need to make sure that the soil fertility is where it should be. I mean, this is no different than any other crop that you're growing, but there are some details with managing soil fertility under no-till. Remember, you're not working nutrients into the ground, so you need to consider when to lime. Um, how much extra nitrogen that might need to be added in a scenario where you're not incorporating N or other um, fertility amendments into the soil. Cover crops, especially when you're looking at um, no-till corn silage, cover crops will become an integral part of your no-till system. You still need to be working on improving soil health and making the best quality seedbed conditions possible. So integrating cover crops into your no-till system will help with your overall so, uh, success. Number eight is variety selection. Remember that conditions are different when you have a no-till field. You need to have varieties that have excellent cold germination rates and very good early season vigor. That will help you improve stand uniform uniformity in your no-till field. Lastly, through this webinar series, you'll be learning about equipment considerations, understanding how to modify, how to maintain, and to make sure that the equipment that you have will do the best job um, and give you the most success in no-till planting. 
Maintenance is so important with, um, with no-till. It's important with everything, but all the parts and pieces must be in excellent working order to be successful in no-till. And then there's lots of accessories, special parts, pieces, row cleaners, closing wheels, um, lots of different components that will be new to you if you're considering no-till planting. And this webinar series will help introduce you to these management, agronomic, and equipment considerations to be successful in no-till. And before I turn this over to Doug uh, Beagle at Penn State, the last thing I'd like to mention is attitude. And this, um, this probably should be number one. And a no-till farmer said this to me once. If you are convinced that no-till won't work, it won't. So part of making no-till successful is having the patience, believing that it's going to work, and doing all the proper, putting all the proper pieces together to be successful. We know that no-till can be successful in the Northeast, in Vermont, in New England. Um, we know the system is successful, so you also need to believe that it can be on your farm for it to work. That's how you'll have the best success. So with that welcome and what you're in store for over the next four weeks, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker in the webinar series, which is Dr. Doug Beagle, a distinguished professor of agronomy um, at Penn State University. And today, Doug will be talking to you about manure management um, and likely some other soil topics in no-till uh, corn production in the Northeast. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Doug. Thank you, Heather. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, my assignment this morning, as Heather said, is to talk a little bit about uh, manure management and no-till and some of the challenges and, and some of the ways we can meet those challenges. Uh, Heather's already talked about uh, you know, the advantages of no-till. Um, we all know it helps reduce erosion. Uh, we get uh, more biological activity in our soils. We conserve moisture. Just overall, uh, better soil quality. A lot of this has to do with residue on the surface. Um, so we know there are a lot of advantages. Here in Pennsylvania, we're somewhere close to 70% of our crop production is now no-till. So it's a, a big deal for us. But uh, one of the big challenges we have is manure management in no-till. Um, Again, in Pennsylvania, we're uh, over 70% of our agriculture is animal-based, so we have a lot of manure that we have to deal with. Uh, we're also in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, uh, which we so we have some uh, uh, challenges with the environmental concerns. Uh, when we look at the trade-offs in manure and tillage, uh, we know that if we can incorporate manure, we can reduce ammonia volatilization, can reduce odor, uh, we can decrease soluble phosphorus loss. However, uh, we know tillage increases erosion, and with that we can get increased sediment phosphorus loss, and just in general tillage, running steel through soil tends to reduce soil quality. We look at no-till manure management, uh, we know we have less erosion, less sediment P loss, we have uh, greater soil quality, improved soil quality in our no-till systems. Um, but we also know that we have increased ammonia volatilization and odor, and we can see increased uh, soluble phosphorus losses with manure in our no-till systems. So the questions uh, that we have been trying to work on are, is there a way to get the benefits of manure incorporation but retain the benefits of no-till? And we know there are going to be trade-offs in that, so we need to understand what the trade-offs are when we're trying to accomplish that. Uh, some of the research we've been doing, I'm going to talk about today, uh, is some of our experiences looking at alternatives for manure application in uh, no-till. Uh, the default, obviously, is just put the manure on the surface. If you don't have tillage, uh, that's where it's going to go. Um, we've also been looking at what we call low disturbance injection. Uh, traditional injectors tended to be more like a chisel plow that really did pretty much full tillage. Uh, these new injectors, uh, like you see in the picture there, uh, basically just cut a slot in the soil, put the manure in, press the slot shut. Uh, don't do a whole lot more disturbance than a no-till planter does going through the field. 
another one that there's a lot of interest in that we've done some work with is aerators. Now, aerator is not truly an injector, but uh, I guess the term is enhanced uh, infiltration. So uh, uh, we're looking at these as ways to, to maybe get manure into the ground in no-till, but still retain those benefits we get from no-till. Uh, nitrogen's a particular challenge in this regard um, because there's so many ways we can lose nitrogen. It can volatilize uh, left on manure and urea fertilizer on the surface, can be denitrified, it can leach, uh, can be carried off and run off in erosion. And one of the problems we have in with nitrogen is if we plug one hole, it tends to leak out somewhere else. So for example, if we go to no-till, we know we can reduce runoff uh, and erosion. But when that happens, we tend to increase volatilization, and in some cases, we increase leaching because we capture and hold more of our water. Uh, so we have particular challenges with nitrogen because of the, the many different ways that we can lose nitrogen. Probably the biggest one, though, that everybody worries about, and rightfully so, from an agronomic point of view, we can lose a lot of nitrogen by volatilization. So if it volatilizes, it's not available to the crop. Uh, this is just a table out of our agronomy guide just to illustrate the impact of incorporation on retaining uh, and recovering nitrogen. You can see as the, the manure lays on the surface longer, the availability drops dramatically <coughs> if the manure is not incorporated. Um, so if we can till it in, if we can inject it in, or even a nice soaking rain, we can't have a lot of runoff, but if we can get a nice soaking rain, uh, to carry the nitrogen into the soil, we can dramatically reduce that volatilization loss. But this has created some serious management conflicts when we're looking at nutrient management plans, which say we need to incorporate manure to retain the nutrients, and conservation plans <coughs> with no-till to help uh, minimize soil erosion. The other thing that uh, we need to recognize about this volatilization loss that uh, is often missed is it happens very quickly. Um, I hear a number of farmers will say, the reason I don't no-till is because I know I need to incorporate my manure, but then they don't incorporate their manure for a week or two after application. And really, if you don't incorporate manure within a day or two, um, that's no reason to till. This is just some of our data uh, looking at a different manure application, but the, the big peak there is, is broadcast manure on the surface, and you can see the peak is occurring within hours of application. We get another peak the next day when things warm up 24 hours later, and after that we get a, a slow, steady <clears throat> volatilization, but most of it happens quickly. So if we're going to do something about uh, reducing volatilization from manure, we have to act very quickly. And uh, I think that's an important thing for people to recognize. Some of our research data looking at, at volatilization loss of ammonia uh, with the different systems, uh, um, no manure, obviously, we're not getting any ammonia loss. But with surface application, uh, that's where we get most of our loss. In this case, we were, uh, our research was showing over 50 pounds of nitrogen lost uh, as ammonia after manure application. Uh, if we till it in, in this case we did it with a chisel plow, and we're probably a little unique here uh, in that in this research we chiseled this in very quickly. Uh, usually within an hour uh, we were had to chisel plow through the field to incorporate the manure. So you can see we dramatically reduced the ammonia loss 84 uh, percent. Here again the timing is, is something that farmers need to recognize because uh, a lot of people don't like to drive through wet manure to chisel, so they say, well, I let it dry for a few days before I want to go back and till it. Well, you may have missed the advantage of tillage if you're waiting three or four days after the manure application to go back and do the tillage. With the shallow disc injector, the low disturbance injection, um, we reduced the, the ammonia loss about the same as tillage, and in this case not quite as much, but, but dramatically reduced the, the nitrogen loss uh, uh, by injecting the manure. The aerator system did result in a, a reduction in ammonia, but much less than with the tillage or with the shallow disc injector. And, and really, aeration is not an injection. Uh, it's just enhanced infiltration. We're poking holes in the ground and hoping the manure runs down in the holes. Uh, in this case, uh, because we're dealing in a no-till system, we're running the, the aerator straight, so it's just basically poking straight holes in the ground and then 
depositing the manure right over those holes. Uh, <clears throat> if we we can explain some of the reason why we don't see as much uh, recovery of nitrogen here and also uh, I get a lot of questions about well you didn't look at my machine or, or it, what about different ways of uh, trying to incorporate manure. Uh, one of the things we've done is look at uh, what's driving the ammonia loss and basically it's if the manure is exposed on the surface you're going to get ammonia and uh, in this data you can see there's a pretty good relationship between the manure on the surface and the amount of ammonia and you can see up here uh, the the aerator had uh, fairly high manure exposure on the surface not as much as the broadcast but a fair amount and, and consequently we see ammonia emission so if we're looking at uh, alternative systems that we think might help us uh, re uh, retain nitrogen uh, the thing to really look at is if you can see manure, you're going to lose ammonia. Uh, so the less manure you can see on the surface, the better. Uh, in this research, uh, it was nice that we had graduate students that could go out with spatulas and gather up the manure and weigh it. That's probably not practical for most of us, but uh, still just a, a, a general visual look to see how much manure is left on the surface. Uh, if you can't see it, it's probably uh, not going to result in very much volatilization. With the inject, with the aerator, <clears throat> this was with dairy manure. Uh, dairy manure, you know, is thick. Uh, it's got fiber in it, so it really doesn't run down in the holes. It kind of oozes down in the holes or sags into the holes a little bit. Um, but you leave a lot of surface area exposed uh, with the manure just deposited over top of these holes, and so that's why we see uh, fairly minimal effect of, of aeration. Uh, running it the way we did. Now, to take it one step further, an uh, aerator is a good example of just saying an aerator works or it doesn't work, really doesn't tell the whole story because we can run these aerators in many different ways. Uh, we did some work here where we compared uh, different ways of using an aerator. Uh, we could band the manure after we ran the aerator and running the aerator straight, no, no angling, so we're just basically poking holes and then depositing manure over the holes, uh, or we could angle the aerator, so we run the aerator at an angle, so now they do much more tillage. You can see in the bottom picture on the left there uh, kind of what it looks like with the aerator run angle versus the above picture is run straight, and we put the manure on top of that uh, basically tilled ground, or we could uh, put the manure on, then run the aerator straight, or put the manure on and run the aerator angled. Um, and we get very different results depending on how we configure the aerator. So here's an example. Now this happens to be with swine manure, and that, that's an important thing we'll talk about here in a second because the kind of manure also makes a difference. But you can see if we angle the aerator, we get much less ammonia volatilization. But basically then it's not no-till anymore. This is pretty much full, full width tillage. A little difference if we... Uh, put the manure on after we don't get quite as much reduction as if we put the manure on and then run the aerator angled over it. If we run the aerator straight, uh, we get more ammonia loss because we're really not doing that tillage. We get a little better result if we put the manure on and then run the aerator through. Uh, you can see the difference compared to, uh, in, in this case, the surface application. Uh, I mentioned the, the point that this is swine manure. Um, you may remember in the previous slide, the dairy manure, we saw a 24% reduction with uh, the aerator run straight. Here we're getting close to 50% reduction with swine manure. I think this has to do with the consistency of the manure. Uh, the swine manure is much more liquid, so it does tend to run down in those holes much more, and we get better incorporation where the dairy manure really didn't run down in the holes, uh, so uh, we didn't get as, as good a reduction in ammonia. So the point here is that uh, you know, you've know got to be careful making generalizations, and we can use these machines in different ways, and we need to understand what they're doing. And I think that the key thing I'll go back to is exposure. If if you're leaving manure exposed on the surface, you're going to get uh, ammonia loss. Look a little bit at phosphorus. Um, phosphorus is less complicated than nitrogen. Uh, we don't have any volatile forms to worry about, so that's good. Uh, in general, if the big losses are with runoff and erosion, so if we can reduce those, which we 
do with no-till. We can generally have a, a fairly significant overall reduction in phosphorus. We don't usually increase leaching dramatically. Uh, very much dependent on soils. Um, real sandy soils are very prone to, prone to leaching. We can get significant loss, particularly if we have uh, drainage, artificial drainage, to so it doesn't have to leach very far. Another uh, issue that you have to be aware of with phosphorus is not as obvious. We, we do reduce the runoff and erosion dramatically with no-till, but now we're putting all of our nutrients right on the surface. So even though there's less runoff and erosion, the runoff and erosion that occurs can be more enriched than it was maybe with a tillage system where we continually mix the nutrients uh, in the soil. Looking at uh, our uh, research with total P loss, again with the dairy manure, um, you can see that all the systems with tillage, the shallow disk, the aeration, all dramatically reduced total phosphorus loss even lower than the no manure treatment. I think this is because we also re tended to reduce uh, runoff in general with these systems. Uh, definitely when you compare it to the surface application, there was a lot more soluble P in runoff uh, than there was with any of these systems. So just getting the manure into the soil so it's not laying up there on the surface uh, can dramatically reduce total P loss. Um, Again, just like with nitrogen, uh, the surface coverage is, is the key thing. Uh, the more manure we had left on the surface, uh, the more uh, phosphorus we lost in, in the runoff. So if we can just get it out of sight, get it below the surface so that when there is runoff or a little bit of erosion, which we can't totally eliminate, uh, the phosphorus itself, the manure, is, is underneath that. So it's uh, not interacting with that runoff water and, and that surface erosion. So still a big thing is, is to try to just look at how much manure is left exposed on the surface. That seems to be the key. Uh, now, we, I mentioned the trade-offs. Uh, can we do this and still retain the benefits of no-till? Here's the soil loss measurements we made in those same plots with the same treatments. Um, and actually, you can see that uh, the shallow disk, the aerator, and even the surface application in no-till actually reduced soil loss compared to obviously where we till we know we're going to get more soil loss and even compared to where we had no manure. Um, so it does kind of answer the question we think that we can incorporate manure in no-till without uh, increasing soil erosion. Um, just click, clicked ahead there, sorry, I wanted to make a point. Uh, you notice even the surface application was uh, uh, lower. It was actually the lowest, and that's because manure itself can act as a residue and help reduce soil erosion. Uh, so here are our measurements of residue covers under these different systems uh, compared to no manure. Obviously, chisel plowing, we, we bury all the residue, so we have very little residue left when we till. Uh, the shallow disk, the low disturbance, does cover up a little bit of uh, residue. Um, the closing disks tend to throw a little bit of soil back over the where the manure was injected, so we reduce it slightly, but not a lot. Where the aerator and the, the surface application both increase residue, mainly it's the manure itself. Uh, so a good thick layer of manure on the surface, like we see with surface application, actually helps reduce erosion because it's it provides a an insulating layer of residue there to stop raindrop impact and so forth, so reducing erosion. Now, the trade-off there is that we tend to expose all these manure nutrients to direct loss. Uh, so again, I think the, the key thing that we've concluded from this is that uh, we can uh, get manure incorporated in no-till um, and still retain those benefits of the no-till system. One other thing we've looked at uh, is uh, odor. Odor is a big issue. We have a lot of rural urban interface in our agriculture here in Pennsylvania. Uh, so odor is a big deal. So we have uh, in our ag engineering department some uh, specialized noses. Uh, people use something called a nasal ranger that they can uh, quantify the intensity of odor. So we did this with our different systems. You can see the surface application. These were measured uh, pre-application less than an hour, two to four hours, and then 24 hours. That's what the three bars are. Um, and you can see, obviously, with surface application, you get a lot of odor. 
the aerator was less, but again, back to that exposure, we still leave a, quite a bit of manure on the surface. Uh, so we, we get uh, odor from that, but either tilling the manure in or, or, or using the uh, shallow disk or another injector that we, we're not using now, a direct injection machine, uh, anything we did to get it in the ground quickly reduced that odor. Uh, and actually, we found uh, talking to particularly commercial haulers that are, are offering injection as an option for their customers, uh, that odor is often the driving force for injection. It's not conserving nutrients. That's, a, that's a obviously an important benefit, but in many cases, it's farmers that have neighbors that uh, they don't want to cause problems. So. Uh, they are uh, looking at injection, at least in areas of their farm that are near neighbors, as a, a, a way to, to reduce some of those problems. Uh, and the last thing is uh, economics. Uh, here we've uh, used uh, integrated farming systems model to model 100 cow dairy uh, to look at uh, the economic impact of these different systems using the results from our research. Um, and the main conclusion here is if you look at uh, surface, which is the default uh, application system for no-till, and compare that to the shallow disk or low disturbance injection, uh, the economics are pretty close the same. Um, it's for different reasons. The surface is, is more economical because it's the cheapest way to go. We can spread a lot of manure in a hurry, uh, minimal equipment requirements. Requirements. Uh, the shallow disk injection, we need uh, to use uh, uh, injectors, so we're paying the capital costs of injectors on the manure. We also know that injection is, is significantly slower uh, than surface application, so it takes more time. Uh, that increases labor costs, which are figured into this. Uh, one of the things we found from our commercial haulers is that uh, the reduction in time uh, with shallow disk uh, isn't as much as most people think. Uh, most of the haulers that have tried this have been pleasantly surprised. It does take longer, there's no question, but it's maybe not as bad as, as they anticipated uh, going in. Uh, probably a bigger issue with the time is uh, not so much the labor cost, which is part of it, uh, but you only have so many days in the spring that, that are fit to spread manure, and if it takes you significantly longer, that can create uh, management challenges there. With the, the chisel plow, uh, there the big thing is the extra cost of tillage. Uh, uh, we do conserve nutrients if we do it quickly, uh, but we have that extra cost. And the aerator, um, we have the extra cost of the equipment, and we don't conserve as much nitrogen, so uh, it doesn't come out quite as good. We have another uh, big uh, uh, dairy farming systems uh, project here at Penn State, with, uh, modeling uh, on in small plots, uh, but a whole farm with different crop rotations. And we found over a six-year rotation, one of the things we're looking at in that is injection versus surface application manure. It's all no-till. Uh, we're saving about a third of our nitrogen. We're using a third less nitrogen where we're injecting manure over that six-year rotation compared to what we do when we surface apply. So a fairly significant potential there um, to save the nitrogen, which keeps it out of the environment, but also uh, to provide some economic returns. So with that, uh, I'll stop. Uh, there's some of our Penn State websites. If you're interested in following up on some of our work, you can find information there. So the first question is, what's the standard amount of time that manure needs to be composted before uh, applying? Well, uh, I, I think uh, with composting, uh, you got to decide why you're composting. Um, my, my personal opinion is that uh, if you're using your own farm, or own manure on your farm, I think there is less advantage to composting. I think one of the, the benefits we get from adding organic matter is not just adding organic matter, but it's all the processing that goes on in the soil in terms of breaking down the manure, releasing the nutrients for crop availability. It provides some of the glues that help uh, improve soil quality in, in terms of aggregate stability, things like this. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not a big fan, actually, of composting for if you're going to use it on your own farm. Uh, there are reasons if you're going to export manure, uh, composting has advantages. Uh, 
uh, you have less odor, you have less bulk, uh, things like that, uh, but you do have a lower nitrogen availability uh, when you apply it to the field. When you ask how long you need to compost it, that's, uh, you know, it, everybody's different. Uh, depends on how stable you want to get. If you want to get really stable compost, the best thing is use temperature to, to determine when it's pretty much done working. Uh, when the microbes are finished, uh, some people, though, just put manure on a pile and maybe roll it over once and call that compost. So there's a, a wide range of what is compost. Um, this person says, you mentioned a difference in manure types, especially swine. Can you just comment on that? Yeah, I think from what we were looking at uh, with the aerator in particular is that the, the swine manure is much more liquid. Uh, so with the aerator, it tended to run down in the holes, and we got much better uh, reduction in ammonia because it, it was actually soaking into the soil. The, the holes the aerator was making was uh, uh, really helping, was enhancing infiltration, where with dairy manure, it, it's thicker, more uh, fiber in it, uh, so it, it doesn't run very much. Even for liquid dairy manure has a lot of fiber, so it, it didn't tend to run down in the holes, so we left more manure uh, exposed up on the surface. So that was, that was the main thing. There's a lot of other differences. Uh, there's a difference in the composition in terms of how much of the nitrogen in uh, the different types of manure are in the ammonium or mineral form to begin with and how much is in the organic, uh, how quickly that organic will, will break down. Um, so when we're looking at availability, it's important to recognize those differences. Uh, and uh, take into account the proportion of nitrogen that's in ammonium form versus what's in organic form and, and uh, kind of our estimates from research on how long it'll take to break it down and release the nutrients. Great. So how is it, um, how, um, how to best handle straw-packed beef cattle manure for no-till systems? Uh, that's a $100 question. There isn't really a good way. Uh, um, it, it, we don't have a way to incorporate that in no-till, so we're pretty much there. We're we're left with putting it on the surface, uh, you know, putting it on as near the time when the crop's going to use it. Putting it on, uh, if we can put it on right ahead of soaking rain. I understand, you know, there's real practical problems with that, but that will help to incorporate. Um, we encourage our farmers if they have liquid and solid, they can maybe inject the liquid. Uh, if they have bare ground, uh, you know, corn silage ground, for example, that's a better place to put the solid manure because you do actually add some residue there in, in terms of the bedding and so forth. Um, we have some uh, work underway here looking at ways to actually inject uh, dry poultry manure, uh, but that's a very different than a, a bedded packed manure. With poultry manure, we can dry it out and make it fairly crumbly, and, and we do have ways that, uh, that we think we're able to inject that, but we don't have a good way for bedded pack manure, unfortunately. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, any concerns planting parallel into injection site with higher manure application rates? Is there a negative effect on germination, et cetera? Yeah, we haven't seen any problems with that. Uh, everybody worries about it, and, and we have looked at it. Uh, um, for the most part, we haven't worried about it. We actually did some plots where we uh, ran the injectors at a slight angle to the row to see if, uh, so we could look at uh, the effect of how close you were. Were you right in the row, close to the row, or far away from the row? Uh, and when we did that, the main thing we saw is the the, the corn that was, in or very close to the row was better. Uh, we didn't see any negative. We measured stands and so forth. We didn't see any negative impacts uh, of that that band. Um, so we're not too worried about that. I mean, I think if you had applied manure, you know, just a day or two before and you planted right down the injection zone, I think you could probably see some issues. Uh, but if it has a little bit of time to weather, you get a little bit of rain on it, uh, we just have not seen any issues. Uh, just as a little aside, uh, when we were doing this angled, we were also going in and, and doing some soil sampling. And to do that, we wanted to know exactly where the bands were. And we realized that uh, when we went back in a month or so after application, we couldn't find the bands. That's a testament to how little disturbance the shallow disk injector does. 
But after a while of crawling around on our hands and knees in the field looking for these bands, one thing we discovered was to look for the worm castings. And where we found we could see right where the, the injection bands were, we had a much higher concentration of earthworm castings over that band. And, and that became our, our way of uh, finding our band when we were doing some sampling out there. Great. So, Doug, your research has, has been focused on large-scale no-till, no but might you have any research or resources for small-scale applications? Uh, well, I, I think it's, it is fairly scale-neutral. I mean, uh, you, you've got to be, for injection, mostly big enough to have liquid manure, and you're going to have to have tanks. But we actually have uh, some Amish doing quite a bit of no-till. Uh, there's a company here in Pennsylvania that specifically uh, adapts corn planters to, to be pulled by horses, uh, so we can plant no-till. Uh, manure injection in, in for the Amish isn't really an option, except most of them actually use commercial haulers to come in, and if they have liquid manure, to come in and spread their manure, so they have that option. I think that's probably the best thing for the smaller operator that may not want to invest in the equipment is if they have uh, commercial haulers and applicators in the region, um, they can, you know, they can get that done without having to invest in the equipment. Um, the cost varies, uh, probably less than ten dollars an acre difference, uh, something like that. But uh, it varies a lot. We tried to do a survey, and it was all over the boards on what the different commercial haulers might be charging to uh, inject versus just come in and, and broadcast applications apply. So okay. I think the, it is available, I think, regardless of the scale. It may depend on the infrastructure that's available to you locally. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, what's the comparison of yield between till and no-till? Well, our experience here is we generally see no-till out yielding tilled ground in the long run. Um, I think uh, I'll go back to something Heather said at the very beginning about having patience. Um, I think we need to recognize with no-till that it, it is a system. It's not just planting with a no-till planter. Uh, if you go into a long-term corn silage field that you haven't no-tilled and plant with a no-till planter, I'll almost guarantee you it's not going to be as good for a few years until you get the surface residue built up, you get the, the biology working in the soil, you get the structure built back up that's been torn down by repeated tillage year after year. Uh, one thing with the patients is I see too many people that try no-till and, and they get maybe three years into it and they say, boy, this, this, this isn't working. I'm not getting as good a yields as I did before. So then they till. And then they go back to no-till for three more years. Well, they're always in that depression that you get uh, when you start out no-till. You've got to give it some time. It may take three to five years to really get the system working for you. Uh, so I think it does take some patience, but if you're willing to go through that, uh, our experience generally has been we get as good and often better yields with no-till because we, we conserve more moisture, it helps us out in our, our drought years, we're getting better soil structure, we have that organic matter build up there and the benefits we have from that. Uh, so I, I think it is, we're going to, if you have the soils, you can do it. If you're in really, really poorly drained soils, uh, it can be a challenge, uh, but in general, uh, most of our farmers are seeing better yields with no-till than without. And that's the final words of wisdom for today. Um, we are at time, and that was an excellent um, conclusion, I think, to today's webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Beagle, for joining us today. You're uh, welcome. It was a pleasure.
Well, John, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time and, and expertise. Um, and thank you all for joining us. I just wanted to give a reminder that, um, you know, this is a series, obviously, and um, next week we've got University of Maine Cooperative Extension's John Jemison and Rick Kersbergen, who will be talking about uh, managing no-till um, soils. So we hope that you'll join us next week as well. And until then, have a great week. Thanks again, John. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Deb. Bye now.